Welcome to the Retro Remix Podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Ami, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Hello, welcome to Watch Your Next Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So happy to have you here. So tell us what you've been up to. I have been writing away. I released uh, my latest Bergman book in September. And then um, my most recent publication was The Mistletoe Motive, which is a Kobo Originals holiday novella. So we're going to chat about The Mistletoe Motive first, but what led you to, what do, What can we expect for the Berman Brothers? Because I know you set up the dates already for the, the last three books coming out. Yeah. I really wanted to lock in those titles. So for people who are unfamiliar with my series, The Bergmans is a big sibling series, sort of in the style of if uh, Bridgerton, there's like a book for each sibling. It's seven siblings. They're Swedish American. They live on the West Coast. And the story sort of dance between the Pacific Northwest and an A-frame, a big, a big expanded A-frame in Washington state, and then where their family moved in Los Angeles. So I have written four books so far. And um, each time I take a word from the previous title and bring it into the next title. So it's sort of like a fun exercise that I like the sort of theme of them all being connected in a small way. And then every time the title is somewhere in the book. So I had figured out my titles and I figured out when those titles get used in the book. And I was like, I really want to get these locked in. So they're all in good reads. Um, so yes, book five is coming. Um, right now, pretty sure it's going to be the spring of 2022. I'm still figuring out some scheduling with the narrators for the audiobook. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm not like, don't, don't hold me to it, folks, but I think yeah. that's when it, it'll be. And then that's the only Bergman I'm going to release in 2022 because my first book with Berkeley comes out in fall of 2022. And I need to leave enough time because they do like longer promotional stretches, obviously, in trad. Um, so I'm going to be promoting that in the summer and leading up to the fall and its release and then through the winter. But then in 2023, that is when the last two Bergman books will be out. So yeah, bittersweet, but. <laughs> oh, this is so exciting. And so let's chat about your Berkeley release before we get to the yeah. social motive. Like, what can we expect from that book, you know? Oh, so my Berkeley books, it's a three book series and it's about the Wilmot sisters and each book is a reimagining of a Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm. So it's um, inspired by, um, the first book is inspired by Much Ado. And it's sort of a twist on for those who are familiar, um, or if you're not, Benedict and Beatrice get tricked by their friends basically into thinking that they have feelings for each other. And then of course they realize ultimately they do have feelings for each other. But I had this idea, it was like, what would they do if they'd figured out they were being duped way earlier? And so that's how I came up with the idea for um, my first book with Berkeley, which is called Two Wrongs Make Right. And it's um, basically they get real, real upset when they realize they've been tricked into um, a blind date with each other after they have a very, very rocky first meeting and decide that they're all kinds of wrong for each other and they never could like each other they get into this blind date and they're like, okay, we're going to get revenge on them. So (laughs) they decide to a fake date (laughs) spectacularly um, and then break up and break everyone's hearts and teach them how nasty it feels to be manipulated. And as is true in the fake dating troupe, they might possibly maybe definitely end up falling in real love. (laughs) I love this. All right. So let's chat about the mistletoe motive. Um, First, what is the elevator pitch and what can readers expect to read this quality note? Novella, no, no, yeah. like so it's, I know <laughs> category. It's category length, you know. It resists categorization. It's long for a novella, and it's a short for a novel. It runs fifty thousand words. Kobo lists it at about one hundred and eighty-five pages, and the audiobook is runs between like three to four hours, depending on the speed you use. So, its elevator pitch is. Um, I'm honestly just going to like read our little spiel that we came up with Kobo and I, because I like it so much. So from the author of the Broken Brothers series comes a slow burn enemies to lovers workplace rivals holiday romance. Perfect for fans of the hating game. And you've got mail set in an indie bookstore during the month of December, the mistletoe motive brims with festive cheer pride and prejudice references and hate to love you tension. That's steamier than a piping cup of peppermint hot cocoa. (laughs) I love this. (laughs) And so what, what led you to have this Kobo original? Like did Kobo approach you or? Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. So I had um, like just released the fourth Bergman book with you forever mm-hmm. in the middle of September. And my wonderful agent, Samantha was like, knock, knock. Copa wants to work with you. Um, the editor, Michelle, really likes your Bergmans and would love to do a holiday project with you. And I was like, okay, it's not a lot of time, but I write fast. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I was like, okay, let's give this a shot. I told them I wanted to keep it on the shorter side, just because especially with like exclusive content, um, I don't want it to be like too big of a project, you know? So I was like, I feel like a novella is a great place to do an exclusive with a platform um, because, you know, the audio book and ebook are only available through either the Kobo app, which you could download onto like your phone, your tablet, iPad, computer, or they have a Kobo reader, which frankly, I like better than a Kindle. It is a beautiful interface and has really easy up down buttons for page turning. Mm. So I'm not getting like arthritis swiping my <laughs> finger. Make, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Um, so yeah, I really, I just like too that also Copa works with libraries. Um, mm. So they very briefly had it exclusively. I think it was maybe like a week and a half that it was just Kobo. And then they were like, it's on the Libby app, request it for your library to purchase it. So now it can be in any library system. So I just really like, you know, as opposed to with, you know, with Amazon, they do Kindle limited. It can't be anywhere else mm-hmm. or you get penalized and you won't get paid for your pages read. So it's obviously, cause that's like very corporate America and very cl- classic to Amazon. They're like, we want a monopoly on your content. Whereas Kobo yeah. was like, we're doing, you know, we're going to invest in the cover, securing the audiobook narrators in a super short time frame, producing all of this. And we're going to put it in libraries. And I was like, that's a no brainer. So I pitched two ideas. The other one, I forget exactly what it was. I think it was sort of like a spin on in a holidays and like the family stone. Mm-hmm. And then the other one, which ended up being the one that I liked better. And I was glad Michelle picked was sort of a riff on you've got mail with some like vibes of the hating game here and there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's sort of where I wrote it mostly in October, had some beta reading and authenticity reading toward the end of the month. And then I turned it in like a week into November. And then it was out like weeks <laughs> later. <laughs> this is like, yeah. Around. And yeah, Kobo is big on um, international. I know in Canada, that's like what the libraries get, you know, as yeah. a yeah. book. so mm-hmm. it, it'll be great for international readers to discover you and be like, Hey, she got a back yeah. this. You know? Yeah, exactly. I, I have been, you know, I did start off, you know, exclusive to Amazon because it's Kindle limit. It's really just a great way to get people to like take mm-hmm. a chance on you. Cause they feel like they're not taking a financial risk. So mm-hmm. I don't want to discredit that and like deny that yeah. I didn't use KU for months. I did. And I completely respect why so many authors use it. And it's very lucrative and the perfect setup for many. I just know that for me, I really did want them to able to be able to be in libraries. I really wanted to have the broadest accessibility and reachability. And so, yeah, working with Kobo just seemed like a really great opportunity to connect with some new folks and find some new readers and just honestly give Kobo people like a chance to have something just for them, you know, because everything's always like pitched toward Amazon or Kindle readers. So that yeah. felt nice to kind of give them a little, little treat. <laughs> I love this. All right. Yeah. So let's chat some questions. Let's chat about what sparked joy over the past couple of years. Um, you know, whether it's book or writing or something else, you know, hobby, whatever it is. <laughs> Honestly, I think over the past year, it's been tough. You know, there's obviously we have incredible sadness and struggle in this world as we continue to deal with the pandemic that's continually evolving and presenting new challenges and has created deep trauma. Um, but I think what sparked joy for me in those times is um, the little moments, like the first time I got to see my friends after months and months of not being together. And we still sat outside and like sat with the table between us, but I got to see their face and laugh and talk or, um, you know, there were some times when I felt like oh, should I be writing these like feel good, happy endings when there's so much going on that's so heavy in the world? Am I being insensitive or is this not right? And then to hear from folks, like especially healthcare workers who were like, your books just gave me some joy and escape Mm -hmm. when I needed it and like made me feel less alone. And I don't know. So just those little moments of feeling like light came in the kind of cracks of the dark place. Mm -hmm. And so often that was just around really simple things like relationships with just my chosen family and friends and writing love stories that I think, you know, gave people uh, the ability to check out from reality, but also to do what I really care about in my romance writing, which is to like allow you to kind of come home to yourself too. You know, I write characters who are 
have real bodies and illnesses and sometimes have mental health struggles and deal with chronic illness or injury and are just people with real imperfections. And I think it's been, I know, I don't think, I know it's been really meaningful, most meaningful to me to hear from folks who it's the first time they've gotten to see someone like them in a romance and to feel affirmed that like happiness and joy and desirability and belonging are affirmed, not just in their personal life, but like that they got to see that in in fiction and got to see themselves validated that way. So it's kept me going. Yes, I love this. And chats and book recommendations, which books group, which books we recommend our listeners to pick up? Oh, it's so tough. This is by no means like exhaustive, but these are just a couple that I feel like I came back to a lot throughout the year or that gave me something in particular as a reader, as a person, um, because I love reading the romance genre, not just writing it. Um, so the first up that comes to mind is The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. This came out of Adria. It's witty, tender, um, a lovely queer romance set in the world of like a bachelor style reality show. Mm -hmm. Um, Charlie is like the Prince Charming um, character who has a ton of, um, he's he's got neurodivergence, he has anxiety, OCD, he's um, dealing with a ton of questions about like feeling close to people and exploring his sexuality. He hasn't really explored it, but he ends up having a very unconventional realization that he's like attracted to um one of the like showrunners mm-hmm. dev who also is dealing with some of his own mental health stuff and is a hopeless romantic but also carries around a lot of like private sadness and struggle and it was just such a witty immersive story it was swoony it was smart it was fabulously paced and i just i felt like it was so compassionate toward mental health neurodivergence Um, exploring and understanding your sexuality, finding love for all of who you are. Um, It was a phenomenal debut to me. And I cannot wait to read more of what she has written. I, I can't recommend that book enough. (laughs) It is a top flavor for me. Yeah. That was like a, I think it brought so much feelings. It was really nice to see representation of like depression, anxiety, sexuality, like all these Mm -hmm. different spectrum of things. Like it was not like, it's not a cookie cutter, like bachelor, you know, like Mm-mm. showrunner thing. There was like actually depth within the story. So. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was, I felt like I just had a lump in my throat the whole time I read it, but it's like that, that good lump in your throat like that. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, this is so rare and wonderful and affirming. So yeah, that's that. And then another one, um, actor age Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the third in her Brown Sisters series. They're standalones, but like you should read all of them because they're great. And it's just that classic British snark, um, Talia's Mm -hmm. signature steam. And it was was just a total home run for me. Um, Eve and Jacob are both neurodivergent. Jacob like says very early on in the book that he's autistic. And we sort of figure out along the way with Eve that she is too. Um, And just seeing the beautiful way that Talia, who is autistic herself, um, Mm -hmm. just explored the nuance and individuality of neurodivergence. It was um, really, again, just like the charm offensive, just an affirming read for me. Like it was funny and swoony and autism wasn't the point of the book. It was just an organic part of it. And that's how it is in my life. Like I am neurodivergent and I don't think about it that often. I just live my life. You know, I thought about it a lot more when I first got diagnosed and it was cool to see Eve processing that. And then you see Jacob who's known since he was like, a boy. So it was, um, and just a really joyful, funny, it's set in a bed and breakfast. There's harassing ducks, which is of course, like very common for that part of England where it's set. It was a waterfowl, as they say, (laughs) it was just joyful and, and delightful. Um, and then the third, well, this is a series, but I really leaned on historical romance this past year. It was just, um, I spent so much time plotting and writing contemporary romance. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to read like a happily ever after that wasn't in that space where I was spending all my work time, historical romance was that perfect, Mm -hmm. perfect place. So this is the Penny Royal Green series by Julianne Long. And that's published through Avon. And if you like Bridgerton, if you like my Bergmans, you will like Julianne Long because she's, better. (laughs) She's, she crafts the most wonderful stories. So basically in a nutshell, the Penny Royal Green series follows like two feuding families that have a very like Montague, Capulet, ancient grudge um, vibe. 
without all the tragedy. And mm -hmm. it's um, just sparkling, character-driven stories. They feel very modern, though, and accessible. They're brilliantly fast-paced, like they move right along, slow burn, sexy, and just really smoldering hot. And she writes incredible enemies or like opposites attract, but clash tension. So, oh, it's just, they, I fly through her books and I love the audiobooks. I forget who the narrator is, but she's excellent. And these are just, they were my total, like, I knew everyone was going to be a winner. I could just be like, okay, time to read the next Penny Royal Green. So I absolutely recommend them to you. If you're hesitant about historical romance, these are great books to start. I love this. Yeah. I actually had them on my TBR and I, I need to get in the mood. I've been on some random moods. I'm, like mood reading um so I know this is like the next one that I'm just gonna dive into this summer like 2022 um yeah like I just love like epic series where there's like family where there's like yeah. winners, finish winners and you just like get to live through this world you know yeah yeah and it's great because they really are all of the characters feel so flushed out and, and individual mm -hmm. and they have these idiosyncrasies and this sibling humor. And it's like the Penny Royal Green is the small little like village where both the, where both the, um, the Eversees and the Redmonds, that's the family names. That's where they live. And they're sort of like the big names in the town. And it's like, there's just this pub where all kinds of silly things happen. And there's great secondary characters. Like it, it builds such an, it's great world building. So it's, you can just totally get lost to them. They're delightful. I love this. Yeah. Right, so tell us where you can find you online. You can find me. Um, I'm pretty much wherever you're supposed to be, but my website is a great place to start because I have all my social links across the top and that's chloeliza.com. And then I'm on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. And, um, on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, it's always Chloe underscore, um, Lisa. So fairly easy to find. Awesome. Thank you, Chloe, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. If you enjoy this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. Today's episode's partner is Libra FM. If you're an audiobook listener, then you should add Libra FM as your go-to source for paid audiobooks. Libra FM makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks to your local bookstore. Memberships start at $14.95, and they also have great sales for women's audiobooks each month for $3.99, thanks to the Kiss Club. To sign up for Libro FM, please visit whattoreadnextblog.com slash Libro FM. You will receive a free audiobook when you sign up for a monthly subscription. If you purchase a subscription through our link, you will be supporting the podcast at no cost to you. The What to Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Please visit frolic.media slash podcast to discover new shows to tune in. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.